Thank you so much, Mr. Browder, for being here with us. Thank you uh, and welcome everybody to McDonald Laurier Institute. Um, we have been having this series of conversations called Democracy Matters, and it's a real honor to be speaking with uh, Bill Browder today, uh, the architect and champion of Global Magnitsky sanctions. Um, let me start uh, right away about what's um, in the news. Everyone in the world has their eyes on uh, Vladimir Putin and uh, Ukraine. And uh, world leaders have been focused on troop deployments and weaponry and diplomacy. And your message has been uh, an entirely different one. You've been saying, um, uh, hit him where it really hurts, uh, his finances. Can you explain why you think sanctioning Vladimir Putin and his oligarchs uh, will be effective in preventing war in Ukraine? Miriam, great, great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> um, democracy definitely matters matters more than any anything today, as we're seeing these types of things, as you're just describing. Vladimir Putin. Um, I, I should point out that anybody at this stage of the game who um, uh, is in Russian government isn't there uh, to serve their country. They're they're there to um, enrich themselves, and. Uh, Vladimir Putin is is one of the um, sort of most successful kleptocrats in the world. He's been in this job for 20 years. He's enriched himself to the tune of $200 billion. And that's been the main project of, of his um, presidency, is to just accumulate as much money as possible. In order to do so, he needs to be as powerful as possible. Yeah. One could argue that to be as powerful as possible, he also needs as much money as possible. It all sort of feeds, feeds together. Mm -hmm. And all that money is not held um, in his name because if he put it in his name um, uh, and somebody had a piece of paper showing that that money was in his name, they could blackmail him um, and show that he was a crook to the Russian people. And so that money is held by people he trusts. I call them oligarch trustees. And those oligarch trustees mm -hmm. keep that money in Russia because as easily as they stole it, it could be stolen from them. They keep that money in the West. Mm -hmm. Or as we're looking at Putin and, and he's flexing his muscles and pounding his chest and doing all this crazy stuff with troops on the border, um, he, he has this one huge Achilles heel, which is that his whole life's work, which is stealing all this money, is exposed in the West. Mm -hmm. and, we have, we, and we have legislation in place already, which we could use um, to freeze that money. It's called the Magnitsky Act. It was named after my lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky. And the Magnitsky Act has the power to freeze the assets and ban the visas of human rights violators and people involved in high-level corruption. And mm -hmm. I think it's pretty straightforward to prove um, to, to the extent necessary that the oligarchs who look after Putin are involved in high-level corruption. And so without a single shot fired, mm -hmm. without any collateral damage, in the most targeted, efficient way, if we, had a, if we credibly threatened him with seizing the freezing and seizing the assets of the top 50 oligarchs who looked after his money, there would be no war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you feel he, as, as a person, is, is uh, hearing this message loud and clear? What indications do you have that his regime uh, fears this approach of yours? Well, it's interesting because, the, so, so, so I, I've been saying, I've been repeating this message um, on TV shows with parliamentarians, with government officials, any chance I can get, because I, I actually, I, I mean, it, I, I know it. And, and so, so by the way, does any other person involved in Russian opposition in, in um, yes. any type of, anybody who's had any sort of real connection um, to struggling with Russia understands this. And for a while, it wasn't getting through. And, it, and it's such a simple message. And every time I go on TV or wherever, people say, well, that's so obvious. Why isn't, you know, why isn't it being done? And for a while it wasn't being done, but then all of a sudden, um, both the U.S. and the U.K. have come out and said that they are um, going to sanction Russian oligarchs who look after Putin's money. And very interestingly, Putin had had kept his head down, hadn't said a word. He had been sitting behind the whole. <clears throat> he had been sit sitting there with all these troop movements, not saying a word. And it was only after the British Foreign Secretary Liz Truss made that statement that the next day he came out saying all sorts of stuff. I mean, it's it's just plain as day to, to me um, that 
that's what the, that that is what Putin cares about. And um, and all of a sudden now he's like, you know, not as uh, you know, he's talking about de-escalation. And he's having meetings with various heads of state like Macron yesterday. And and, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. But but if if the, if the message was credible and I don't think it's fully credible, because if you just have the U.S. and the U.K. doing it and you don't have the EU doing it, that's not a very credible threat. But if you have the U.S., U.K., EU and Canada, um, uh, that is a credible threat. So this is where you see the real leverage from the free world on a dictator like Vladimir Putin is in the finances, actually, not in the military, not in the uh, political or diplomatic halls, but it's where they have their assets. Um, well, there's a famous, um, uh, a very famous uh, chess champion named Gary Kasparov. Gary is not only a chess champion, but a, um, uh, a Russian opposition leader. And he and he he coined a, a beautiful expression, which is we can fight them in the banks instead of with tanks, and that's what we should be doing. It's just so so obvious, so plain, and it's such a an asymmetric way of uh, an asymmetric and efficient way of dealing with them because it's not like they can retaliate and freeze our money in Moscow because we don't have any money in Moscow. No people right. Westerners don't keep their money there. Yeah, how did we get here that London and other places in the in the free world are being used? By Putin and also other dictators to to keep their money. Well, um, we got here because for twenty years, all sorts of um, individuals, real estate agents, lawyers, accountants, uh, concierges, drivers, restauranteurs, jewelry sellers, yacht brokers, um, were feeding on this unbelievable. Uh, you know, at this feeding trough of Russian corruption, all this dirty Russian money came to London and um, and not just London, the south of France, mm -hmm. uh, Sardinia, Marbella, Courcheval, Paris. Hmm. Uh, and and uh, and all this money is starting sloshing around. And a lot of people were making, you know, getting rich on a small scale compared to the Russians. It was a, you know, practically like you know, tipping, tipping the bellboy, but, um, uh, uh, but a lot of people were making what they considered to be a lot of money here in London and places like that. And, and, um, and the Russians were also spending money on politicians. They were, mm -hmm. and, and, and I wouldn't even call it bribing politicians in the UK. There were members of the house of Lords, which is the upper lawmaking body who were officially in, in their declared, uh, uh register of interests, taking money from from Russian oligarchs and other Russians to do Russian work yeah. for them. So beyond Magnitsky, do we need other legislation to prevent that corruption, for, uh, prevent that nefarious influence in the West? Well, you don't even necessarily need legislation. I mean, legislation helps. Like, as mm -hmm. I said, the EU needs to add corruption to their uh, Magnitsky Act because it only includes um, uh, it only includes human rights abuses at the moment. But a lot of it is just enforcement of laws. So uh, mm -hmm. in Britain, they don't. They, they there is no such thing as as serious law enforcement. And so, if you're a bad guy, you, you're you're pretty much guaranteed to um, be able to keep your money safe without anybody poking their nose into your affairs. And um, it's not true in America. <clears throat> in America, you know, if you get on the wrong side of the Department of Justice, you know, the the full weight and force of the U.S. government will come after you. But in Britain. Nothing like that is true, and so if you just if you just look at the number of of investigations, um, and I know this for a fact because I've been involved in trying to um, get different law enforcement agencies in different countries to investigate the money laundering connected to the murder of Sergei Magnitsky, yeah. and um, we found that money in a lot of different countries. But one place which is notably uh, unwilling to investigate the money we found has been uh, Britain. Mm. Could you talk about Sergei Magnitsky? He was your attorney. Could you talk? I know you have spoken about this many times, but for our audience today, who was he? Um, and why did you, why have you devoted your life and named the, this uh, sanctions um, strategy for him? Sergei Magnitsky was my lawyer in Russia. He became my lawyer after um, the Putin regime expelled me from the country. They expelled me from the country because I was involved in exposing corruption in the companies I invested in as a fund manager. <clears throat> so I was a um, 
I would call myself an enemy. I was an enemy of the regime. Uh, Sergei Magnitsky uh, was hired to help me after my offices were raided by the Moscow police. Uh, he investigated the office raid and he discovered that the office raid was used as a pretext in order to grab documents, which were then used in a complex fraud in which government officials stole $230 million of taxes that my companies had paid to the Russian government from the Russian government. So it wasn't my money that was stolen. It was the Russian government's own money stolen by Russian government officials. Sergei Magnitsky discovered it. <clears throat> he exposed it. He testified against the officials involved. And he was subsequently arrested by the same officials he exposed, tortured for 358 days, and murdered um, in Russian police custody at the age of 37, leaving a wife and two children. And um, his murder um, uh, weighed on me like nothing has ever weighed on me. It was He was effectively killed as my proxy. And so on the day that I learned of his murder, which was the day after he was killed, um, I made it my life's mission to go after the people who killed him and make sure they face justice. And for the last 13 years or so, that's what I've been doing. And um, uh, and as we discussed, this law called the Magnitsky Act now exists. It exists in 34 countries and allows the governments of those countries to freeze assets and ban visas of human rights abusers and kleptocrats and um, uh, named after Sergei. And it's really kind of a revolutionary change in how yes. victims can deal with uh, human rights abuse. Along the path, these last 13 years, what have what have been the biggest challenges? What would you say it has been the biggest challenge? Well, the biggest challenge has always been <clears throat> not the Russians. The Russians, of course, have been fighting it at every step of the way. And, and now that we're using it against the Chinese, they're fighting it and, <laughs> and, and so on and so forth. But the biggest challenge in my mind has actually been the bureaucracy, the bureaucracies of different governments, you know, the employees in the State Department in the United States, the employees in Global Affairs Canada, the Foreign Office in Canada, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in the UK. Mm -hmm. You basically have these people whose job it is to maintain good relations with every tin pot dictator and every uh, autocrat in the world. Yeah. And it's their job to maintain relations. And now all of a sudden we're asking them to punish people in those countries, which will clearly aggravate relations. And those people have done everything possible. And, and and they know all the tricks in the book because they're the ones sort of sitting on the front line who have to enforce this thing, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that it doesn't get enforced properly. And so it's, it's um, that's, that's really the um, uh, bottleneck in this, in this whole exercise is these, is these people who really just don't want to, you know, they have a conflict of interest, essentially, essentially their, their interest is maximize good relations. Um, everyone else's interests are to um, make sure that villains um, can't bring bring their blood money into our um, clean countries, and and uh, and it's really a problem. And I've I've been sort of at it, and I continue to be at it, and we'll will continue to be at it, um, trying to force these people to do something that they're not comfortable doing. Yeah. So the irony here is that your biggest um, challenge has been with the governments of democracies uh, for them to change the way they think and act. Um, do you see things at a sort of a, a macro level uh, worsening in terms of uh, a resurgence of dictatorship? Or do you think that um, awareness and actions like Magnitsky are creating um, obstacles for these repressive regimes that didn't really exist before? How do you see it? When you weigh it all together, how, how do you see things going? Well, I, I, I see things getting a lot, lot worse. Um, I mean, there's no way that anybody involved can't. I mean, we have a, there's a, a you know, genocide taking place in China right now with, with the Chinese repression of the Uyghur minority where, you know, millions of people are in concentration camps. You have Duterte, the um, dictator in um, the Philippines who's running death squads, killing, killing anybody who he feels like killing. You've got uh, uh, Erdogan in Turkey. You've got Putin, of course, in Russia. You have Bolsonaro in Brazil. And it's just a situation. I haven't mentioned Iran. I'm not an expert on Iran. I, uh, I'm sure you have a lot to say about that. Um, and you just got this, <clears throat> the, the, um, 
uh, the world is getting a lot worse. And um, yeah. the Magnitsky Act is a, is a useful tool and, it, and it, it creates a consequence in a world where there hasn't been any consequence before. But I think it would be overstating it to say anything other than we're faced with some of the most unpleasant and grave challenges that we've ever seen in our lifetimes right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's demoralizing, but in a certain way, it's also energizing because, um, you know, you can't sit back and do nothing. You have to do something. And that's, you know, my, my, my mission has morphed from just a justice campaign for Sergei to justice mm -hmm. for other people. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to ask you economically for countries like Iran, Russia, where oil and gas are a huge um, part of the economy, a part of what, what fuels the mafia state, if you will. Um, do you think that these regimes can make up uh, for the kind of pressure that Magnitsky sanctions or even broad-based sanctions uh, can create on them by turning around and selling their oil and gas to each other, like in the case of Iran selling to China, we see the Biden administration closing its eyes on the sanctions that it has imposed, the United States has imposed itself. Or in the case of, of Putin, too, do you think that if his assets were frozen and seized in the West, could he make up for that because of the nature of the Russian economy by selling more, more oil and gas or no? <clears throat> um, well, I mean... <laughs> If he's if he's like spent all this time and energy stealing all this money and then all of a sudden that money gets frozen, even if he gets more money, I mean, you know, I, I, I mean, it's just anybody who's got money and it gets frozen feels pretty angry about it. I mean, I can tell you that for sure. Yes. And, and so it would, change, it would change his behavior, it would change his calculus. It would make him see the West differently. Well, I mean, everybody acts on the basis of of risk reward. You know, what 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 is the reward for doing something terrible and and what is the risk? Yeah. And if the risk is you're going to lose all your money, you know, that, that for somebody who values money, in fact, Putin values money more than human life, that's that's a pretty big risk. And that's a pretty big downside. And so it, as you say, it changes his calculus. Doesn't mean he doesn't do the bad stuff, but you know, he's sitting there right now trying to decide: does he invade Ukraine or does he not? And if we can credibly say, um, if you do invade Ukraine, you're going to get personally poor because all your money is going to get frozen. Yeah, um, I think that that's a pretty um, clear message. Yes, certainly. Um, through this experience, um, how do you uh, perceive human rights activists and dissidents on the ground still in Russia and other places? How do they um, receive this kind of approach, the strategy of Magnitsky? How does it help them in their fight domestically? It's so interesting to... Um, see how Magnitsky has been uh, grasped by every victim group <clears throat> as a tool to use. And if you're, <clears throat> if you're a victim, it's kind of clear that, that you, you want to target the person who has victimized you. And the person who's victimized you almost in every case has done it for money or mm -hmm. has accumulated a lot of money in the process of their um, bad behavior. Yes. And, and, um, and so in every, in every place that I've ever been, the, oh, the constant conversation is, how do we get so and so, who did this terrible things on the Magnitsky list? And and uh, mm -hmm. you know the, the frustrating part now is we have the laws. I mean, it took us, uh, you know, a decade or more in some cases yeah. to get these laws in place. Um, but I don't have a clear answer in, in many situations because these governments don't have a transparent process for putting people on the list, and they're avoiding and resisting as much as they can. And so that's the next big chapter in our fight and the next big challenge. Um, but fortunately, I'm not doing this entirely by myself anymore because there's so many people that see the value of this that they can also get involved in this, in the, in the advocacy and, and, and convincing lawmakers and, and uh, governments that, you know, more people need to be sanctioned. And it's been a, a, a big inspiration to so many people across the world. And um, I think that it's fair to say that democracy activists, human rights defenders really look to Magnitsky as, as uh, something that gives them moral strength. Um, for you, what keeps you going every day? What, what, what motivates you, continues to motivate you? 
Well, the main thing that motivates me is the is the um, uh, is the horrible injustice that was done to Sergei Magnitsky. He was he was killed as my proxy. He was killed because um, he was my lawyer, and I owe it to him as a uh, uh, as you know he gave his life up at the age of thirty seven, and I owe it to him to make sure that that um, the people who killed him faced justice, and that his 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 death wasn't a meaningless death, and so his. Uh, legacy is is really in the Magnitsky Act and and the more I can do on that it doesn't it doesn't in any way lift the uh, alleviate the um uh the guilt that I feel but but it 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 does give me a little bit of reprieve in the mm -hmm. sense that I feel like I'm doing something for him and something for his memory and something which if he were looking down he would say you know I could see you know that my life wasn't meaningless that that I had a that you know, my life and my death and my sacrifice has changed the lives of others and hopefully saved the lives of others. Um, the Olympics are, are happening in China now, and I, I know that you've also been focused on that. Um, what, is, what can be done with China in general, and how did we get this uh, Olympics thing wrong? <laughs> well, I mean, China is such a, China is a much tougher nut to crack than than any country like Russia or Venezuela or even Iran. I mean, China's just in a major class by itself. First of all, they're much cleverer than all these other dictatorships. The Chinese are playing a, a, a 50 or 100 year game as opposed to a, a one week game, which is what Putin is playing, or a one year game. And um, because they're playing long term yeah. um, and because they have such unbelievable economic power, um, it's it's going to be a really tough fight because there's so many people who have who will be disadvantaged, economically impacted, inconvenienced yeah. um, by any kind of action. And the Chinese know exactly what to do. You know, they they, they you know the um, you know some MBA player says something bad about China, and all of a sudden they cut off you know and National Basketball Association games in China. Um, to punish them, yeah. you know, it's it's really they're they're hardcore. They play they they play clever, and 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 they are really the ultimate threat to to freedom and democracy. Yeah. They, they love to make us all their slaves, and however they define that. And so, it's such an important uh, thing that we start to recognize that and and put up whatever types of barriers for that type of behavior. I agree. Um, what kind of repercussions have you faced and, and your efforts in the network of people that you work with? How have dictators responded to you? How, how have they tried to intimidate and prevent you from moving forward? Well, I mean, their, their methodology is um, murder, hostage taking, uh, uh, arrest warrants, lawsuits, and all this type of stuff. And there's various people, I mean, you know, first of all, Sergei Magnitsky was murdered, but uh, there's a whistleblower who came to us so named Alexander Parapolichny. He died suddenly um, uh, at the age of 44, jogging outside his house in London. We believe he was poisoned. Uh, Boris Nemtsov, the, the um, uh, uh, leader of the Russian opposition, who was a major uh, mag uh, advocate of Magnitsky acts around the world and testified in every lawmaking body for it was mm -hmm. murdered. Vladimir Karamurza, who is um, Boris Nemtsov's protege was poisoned within an inch of his life and then was poisoned again yeah. in Moscow. Um, they've come after me with death threats, kidnapping threats. They've issued eight Interpol arrest warrants to try to get me back to Moscow so they can wow. kill me in a Russian prison. They've come to the British government trying to extradite me. I mean, on and on and on and on and, and more and more and more and many other people as well. And it's, it's uh, you know, and, 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 and their whole thing is not just to try to terrorize me and my colleagues, um, but it's also to terrorize anybody else who thinks that they could do um, what we're doing. And they want to make an example out of anybody who stands up to them. What's the discourse inside the country in Russia right now about you and Magnitsky? Is it is it a very strong red line? Is there a lot of self censorship or no? Do they do do dissidents and human rights activists speak about you? I, I I imagine there's a lot online that doesn't happen, you know, 
in the real world in, in Russia. Can you talk a bit about that? Well, anybody who's a real dissident um, is the you know first customer of Magnitsky sanctions. So, for example, Alexei Navalny, he's probably the most popular opposition politician in Russia today. Yeah. Putin tried to kill him with uh, uh, a banned chemical agent called Novichok. It didn't work. He survived. He's, he survived, but he barely, but he barely made it. He had to uh, go into a coma. He was airlifted to Germany. He spent a month in a coma, eventually recovered. And, um, and they didn't want him to come back to Russia. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he has a real sort of Nelson Mandela type of character. He said, this is my country. I'm not going to be dissuaded from coming back. He said, but if something terrible happens to me, here's a list of 35 uh, Putin cronies who hold his money for him. If something terrible happens to me, I, I, he said this to his colleagues, I want you to take this list to all the major governments of the world that have Magnitsky Acts and get these people sanctioned under the Magnitsky Act. And that's probably the uh, most relevant example of how the Magnitsky Act is used. Now, it's, it's, uh, sadly, so far, those, the, the, the Navalny 35 have not been sanctioned yet, but um, uh, these things take time. And, and I think that eventually, for example, these names are now included in the um, Menendez bill, um, Menendez sanctions bill. And so th there's, there's a lot of movement in that direction, but yeah. everybody in every country that's dealing with these types of issues, there's nothing, there's basically nothing else you can do. There's no other tool to fight dictators other than the Magnitsky Act. Yeah. As far as policymakers go, you mentioned the U.S. Senator uh, Bob Menendez. Who else generally in, in any country in the world has been a big uh, champion, people who you really consider are your allies, who hopefully can be uh, the beginning of the creation of more momentum for, for more policymakers to, to get on board? Well, the, um, <clears throat> the best person on this um, in the United States is... Um, Senator Benjamin Cardin of Maryland. He was the My original, state. <laughs> he was the original <laughs> sponsor of the Magnitsky Act. He did it together with John McCain. Sadly, mm -hmm. John McCain is no longer with us. And it's very sad for a thousand different reasons. But um, one of them is that I think that we would get we, we would it would, it would be better to have <clears throat> have him around doing this. Uh, we also have um, uh, Senator Roger Wicker, a Republican from Mississippi, who's co-head of the uh, U.S. Helsinki Commission, who's very, very strong on this. And it was one of the original co-sponsors with Senator Cardin. Um, Representative uh, Jim McGovern, he was the original sponsor of the Magnitsky Act in the House of Representatives. Representative Chris Smith, who is mm -hmm. his Republican counterpart. Um, and of course, there's many, many others. I mean, I mean, I, I, um, I just finished writing my second book and I yes. had to, um, uh, I, I was creating the acknowledgement page at the end about who had helped with the Magnitsky Act. And it literally goes on for pages and pages because there's just so many different people who played a role in different places. But um, uh, those yeah, are that's wonderful. That's really good to hear. Tell us about your new book. Uh, my new book is called Freezing Order. It's um, it's a book about um, the investigation that we conducted into the money that, that Sergei Magnitsky discovered and was killed over. Yeah. And we wanted to find out who got it and so that those people would have that money seized from them uh, using a freezing order, which is the name of the book. And as we investigated, <clears throat> we discovered more and more of the money. And as we discovered more and more of the money, we eventually discovered um, that some of the money went to Vladimir Putin. Wow. And the reason, one of the main reasons why Vladimir Putin hates the Magnitsky Act so much, and amazingly, one of the main reasons why Vladimir Putin interfered in the U.S. presidential election um, was to um, try to uh, stop the Magnitsky Act and stop it from growing. Um, and um, it's a book all about the mission to find that money and all the terrible things that happened and, um, and some of the triumphs in between. Okay. Well, on that note, uh, I want to thank you again, Mr. Browder, for this opportunity, particularly when uh, events really uh, demand your attention. Thank you for your time. Thank you all, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you.